Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel and the second part of my three-part series on bar exam study success. I took the bar exam in July of 2021 and I'm now filming this series to try and share with you everything that worked for me in getting that 306 and then becoming a Washington attorney. I'm Canadian qualified and throughout my career as an attorney I've taken many many exams. I'm kind of a professional exam taker at this stage because I did my law degree in England, then I came back to Canada, took some more exams as part of my LLM. I took some more exams to qualify to become a Canadian attorney, then I took some more exams to get called to the bar in Canada, um, which is at the end of your articling year. Then after that I entered the securities regulation sphere and as part of that I took the Canadian securities course which involved two more exams. And after that I became a certified fraud examiner which involved you guessed it, more exams. And then a few years after that, I decided that I wanted to become a US attorney and took the Washington bar at the most recent one, which involved more exams as well. So this video is going to be the pinnacle of all of those learning experiences, but it's not my only video on study tips. I have done some before. I intentionally did not revisit them because I wanted to share tips that were specifically germane to my bar exam experience, which is a very difficult um, set of exams, especially for foreign qualified lawyers, but also for everyone. Everyone I have spoken to has traumatic memories of those three to 10 months depending on your background that they spent studying for the bar. So I think tips from that experience from someone who's gone through that are actually going to be pretty useful for everyone and I wanted to do this video before I go into the bar specific product review video I'm going to do next because I hear from a few of you that you are facing the February bar exam and so I wanted to give you some tips that might be useful for that as you gear towards that. Many of you are professionals who are facing all kinds of exams for accounting, for nursing, for medical school, for all sorts of different fields and I'm so proud to have you as part of my community so maybe you'll find something useful in this video as well depending on where you are in your journey welcome it's so nice to have you here I'm a person of many interests and one of them is running my own business so right now if you're looking for a little gift for Valentine's Day I'm running a sale where if you purchase one of these or those hanging up in the background too, any of my cashmere scarves you get a free pair of studs so I thought I would mention that before we get started but let's get into these books that I have here hanging out on my armchair. So the bar exam is an overwhelming experience because I think irrespective of which um, prep course you might take, the first step is to be literally overwhelmed with the heaviest box of books I have ever received. And I've dealt with a lot of books, you know, the um, certified fraud examiner book set is like a thick stack if you're actually going to have it on paper. But Barbary takes it to the next level and they send you so many books that I think if you took two years to prepare for the bar exam, you could probably still not get through the whole thing. It's really insane. I think they send you too much. It actually is counterproductive, um, but it's a good way for me to start out with this first tip, which is no matter what it is that you are studying for, you're gonna start off with a huge volume of stuff. And that's not an accident irrespective of who's delivering that stuff, if it's the accrediting body, like the certified fraud examiner body, or um, the bar, the NCBE, whichever body is presenting you with the materials, that is going to deter a lot of people. Just the idea of having to read all that material, memorize a lot of it, digest it, understand it, and then score well using that information is just not something that many people feel comfortable doing. But I'm here to tell you in this series, it is doable, I've done it several times, and you can do it too. You can also do it while you're working full time, which is the most difficult, but it's also not impossible because you can actually use that diversity of your everyday life 
to your advantage. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in this video because I know it will be the case for many of you, even if you're working while you're a student, but also if you are already embarked in your you know, full-time professional career and you're seeking a new accreditation, whatever that may be, you're gonna to have to balance a lot of things in your life. That first experience of receiving that bulk of material, for me, it was very overwhelming when I received all of the Barbary books. And it's so many different things as well. They send you everything from like these little flashcard things that you can open up, which reminded me of grade school, to these enormous books like this one. So what do you do with that? How do you even get started? They'll have their own guide on how you can handle that, but I think it's good to keep in mind that you are essentially entering an exercise that involves going from broad to narrow and how broad you start and how narrow you go is the first and most important step for you to determine and that's going to be different for every exam and for different personalities as well are you going to end up with something like a set of notes on paper equations on the back of your hand that you sort of read while you're doing other things that you post on post-its i've been a big fan of post-its at some points during my study career it's gonna look different depending on the circumstances. But knowing that that is the exercise that you are embarking on, that in a way that is the purpose, of course there's a lot of other layers of purpose going on as well in terms of actual learning, but the overall exercise is to take a huge amount of information and synthesize it into something that you can work with and crack those problems that you're gonna be faced with on the exam with that set of digested down knowledge with. And I think there's not enough conversation about that and you kind of get to the last, I don't know, two weeks or something like that of Barbary and they start talking about these one page outlines that no one has ever mentioned before during any lecture during the entire thing. They suddenly kind of spring that on you that that's what you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be at. How do you get through it? Well, my way of dealing with it was to start planning to have one binder. Of stuff and in this binder right now because I took the MPRE the professional ethics exam after I completed um, the bar exam what I actually have in here just like pulled this out of a drawer is um, only outlines for the MPRE that I had put together so um, here's what I started with for the MPRE I started with this plus um, the NCBE also has some materials that they distribute on the um, MPRE but the Barbary book which is actually free this is a, like an unusually free thing so if you're studying for the bar definitely get this so this is something that they distribute for free as a kind of marketing strategy to get you to purchase the entire bar course with the expectation that you're going to be taking this first but as a foreign qualified lawyer I took it after um, so this is what I started with for that and this is what I ended up with you can see about how thick it is and then a few post-it notes um, with little scribbles of things to remember this is the same binder I call it pineapple binder and you can see proof that this is well loved well used look how the gold is rubbing off it's from Target if you want one too um, I started to ascribe a kind of m magical energy to this binder. I took it with me everywhere. If I was going for a drive for the day to go somewhere, I would take it with me in case I had to wait somewhere. Um, if I was going into the office and I was going to be there over a meal time, I took it with me. As part of that journey of broad to specific, you should also schedule your time around it. So how is every day going to look? And again, only you know your circumstances, but here's what mine were like. I am not not a morning person but I tried to get some studying in every day in the morning before I would start work and at lunch and then after work so interspersed and that left pretty small chunks of time but that actually is something that you can use to your advantage so here is how working full-time isn't necessarily going to be something that cripples you but rather something that you can use to your advantage I can make you a guarantee I don't care what it is that you are studying I guarantee you it's very different from the job that you're doing even if your career is very closely aligned with the accreditation that you're seeking there just always is a big gap between what the material
material you're learning is for any academic or professional certification versus the day-to-day -day practice that you are doing. And I think this is especially true and kind of roll your eyes true for attorneys. I'm a corporate and securities attorney. The corporate section of the bar exam is like this much material. Um, and then everything else has nothing to do with what I do in the day-to-day. -day. But that's actually a good thing because you take breaks from work, you take a break to eat at lunch, you usually like don't dive straight into work the moment that you wake up. And even if you're working long hours in the evening, you're probably still gonna take a break at some point. So use that to your advantage and put the studying into those gaps so that it is your break from your work and your work is your break from your studying. And that is the only way that you are gonna make this work. I think people who go into taking the bar exam while working full time and expect to do all of their studying during the weekend, and you know, if you're in a very busy profession to have those weekends be an entire sort of vacuum of studying is not reasonable and you're going to set yourself up for a very unpleasant life. So. If you can, you know, I know it's not gonna be possible for everyone, but I think it's something to strive for to get studying into every single day, even at the very beginning. So when you're starting off with that broad slate of materials, use your day to start broad and get more and more narrow on a topic during the day. Whatever your best, highest quality time is, and for me, it would probably be the evening, I'm not much of a morning person, use that time for the most important studying for studying for the bar. I think not many people will argue with me that there's one thing that is more important than anything else you can do, and that is taking practice questions and doing so critically. So this is gonna be multiple choice for the most part. Whether you get it right or you get it wrong, you're always going to read the explanation and you're always going to think about what, what did this question really get at? What was the trick? Is the learning takeaway from this practice question? And spend twice as much time on those practice questions as you think that you need to. I'm gonna talk more about those in a minute, but that's how you know an example day would be for me of studying for the bar, going from broad to specific throughout the day. And a lot of people have very strict study schedules. You know, they'll plan out the whole week. The nature of my profession and my life, as well as a business owner and everything, made it difficult for me to do that. Have the kind of schedule where I knew what I was gonna be studying exactly seven days from then. If I felt like I was struggling with a subject, I would put that on a weekend. So let's say civil procedure on Saturday, property on Sunday, although that got better, and I have some really, really good tricks and um, resources for you for property law. Definitely watch my next um, video if you wanna hear about those, but let's say those are your most difficult subjects. Put those at the weekend, because obviously you are going to potentially have more time and more headspace when you're not in the middle of your work week. Um, and then put easier subjects, I think usually towards the beginning of the week. So let's say something like evidence um, would be a little bit easier for me because I had studied it more in depth before and it's pretty similar to um, the law of evidence in Canada. So I think I had that on a Monday, um, but I switched it around. And then Tuesday you can do a different subject. If you have really busy couple of days that week with a lot of meetings, you could also split a subject between two days. Here's what I did that I did without fail and that is to set out a goal number of practice questions and do those every day. Every single day without fail. It doesn't matter if it's a busy day or an easy day, you are still going to do those practice questions and for that reason my next point is set yourself a low bar. So you should have a low bar, a medium bar, and a high bar of what you're trying to achieve every day. And that will change over time. But my low bar didn't change much um, from the beginning of studying to the end. And that was to do 30 multiple choice questions every single day, usually in chunks of 10. That is the thing that I kind of really went crazy with. It goes against um, the kind of Barbary theology as well. Um, and that is that you should have one sacrificial practice exam. And this one goes not just for multiple choice, but also for essays and for um, the MPT as well, which is kind of a stumbling block for a lot of people at the end because they literally leave it 
to the very end where they don't even know what it is until the last few weeks of studying. And I truly do not recommend that because it is a very even physically grueling experience because you essentially get a booklet of material. I mean, if it's on a laptop, you're not gonna perceive it that way, but that's what it is. It's a lot of pages um, of a fact pattern that you have to get through and read and then synthesize into legal advice in a short amount of time. And so a lot of people leave that for the very end. Here's how you avoid that. Set aside one sacrificial exam at the beginning that you are going to knowingly go into with the expectation that you will botch it. I know that's crazy, but trust me, do this. It's something that I've done four years. If I had a bunch of practice exams, let's say you even have as few as three. I didn't always have a lot of practice exams when I was in law school. I have this kind of reverence around practice exams, like it's something that I need to save until I'm just the most ready person in the world for that exam and I know everything and all of that kind of reduction from broad to narrow has already happened and I feel like I have everything in my head before I can even allow my eyes to glow glance at it. I'm being dramatic for the sake of it, but it's true. I, I'm here to tell you they are not. You can sacrifice at least one of those and take it before you're ready. And if you need someone to give you permission to fail it and botch it, here I am. This is me doing that. Please take that exam and botch it. It will help you so much. It's kind of like sometimes you also need to reach a low before you can build on that and realize that for essays, it's not gonna be perfection because guess what? You have 30 minutes. You don't have more time than that. You don't have an hour. You don't have two hours, which is usually what I had in law school. You have 30 minutes to write a decent answer. It is not a lot of time when you factor in actually reading it for the first time. Have that experience. Let your body, you know, kind of on a cellular level, experience that so that you can get over it with a lot of time to spare before you actually have to do it for real. Take that exam. I know it's gonna be awful, but it's worth it to get it out of the way. Because one of the things I learned too is that some of the subjects that I was strong on in terms of just general understanding of substance like evidence, I was allowing myself to be tricked with the multiple choice questions in really silly ways. And knowing that at the you know very beginning, on, at the earlier side of studying, really helped me to make intelligent studying choices with that. So I wasn't just kind of reading the same thing over and over that I always already understood, but I was trying to actually more like crack the questions and figure out where the tricky ones are. It's not about knowing the right answer, it's about knowing the best answer. And once you figure that out, figure out how the examiners think in setting out those questions that don't have one right answer, but rather a best answer, you will be so far ahead of the curve. So again, that's something that I think a lot of people kind of focus on at the end. Know it at the beginning. This is not a test of how smart you are. It's a test of how good you are at outsmarting the examiners. And Barbary does a good job of building that into your head throughout. They kind of gamify it in terms of how they discuss it, which is quite a popular approach. It kind of you know brings out the inner competitor in you as well. It's not you versus the other candidates who are taking the exam. It's you versus the examiner and not letting them trick you because every single question, even the easy ones, have a little twist. They have a few answers that are always kind of there to mislead you that those are the right answers. Do not allow yourself to be sucked into that. Be the smart person who knows that from the beginning and everything that you are doing in terms of your learning is catered to that mindset. So you don't start off with an academic, I want to be, you know, the kind of person who gets the right answer, who's that, you know, stellar um, source of knowledge, but rather be the person who outsmarts the game from the beginning in terms of how you're structuring your studying. Switching gears a little bit, for exams that have essays, and this is something not to forget about when it comes to the bar or any you know exam where there's going to be an essay, I think even the SATs have essays. They did when I took it, and a lot of people were just incredible 
incredibly vastly underprepared for that section of the exam because you're so terrified of the multiple choice that you train yourself to be good at that and that's very important still arguably more important than the essays but the essays are still something that people do fail on so use the essays to your advantage because the stuff you learn for the essays guess what half of it is on the multiple choice as well. So everything that you kind of learn a greater depth of knowledge of for the essays will serve you on the MBE as well. So, and that'll be the case for many professional exams that have essays. The essays are not often on something that is entirely discrete from the rest of the stuff that you're learning. So this book right here from Barbary doesn't have a co cover anymore, but you can see the spine. It's called MEE Testing. I think this is the best book that Barbary, Barbary provides other than multiple choice questions but those are in the online system and you know much easier to take on there in terms of the physical books that they delivered to me this is the book that I actually used the most slash the only one that I really used a lot um, and so this is the one that has six um, essays like sample essays um, for each topic so let's see well why don't I follow my kitty cat little post-it here so of course, big surprise. It's on civil procedure, what a surprise. So what I did is I had a lot of post-its in here originally and then I pulled them out as I felt comfortable with the material. So of course the last one that's left is a civil procedure one about removal jurisdiction and federal question jurisdiction and diversity jurisdiction. Many of you will hear those as traumatic words and for that I apologize, but um, civil procedure was something that I was very unfamiliar with when I came to the bar exam and so these essays really helped me to understand not just you know the key information you know like the, those little equations that they do with states in order to figure out whether a diversity jurisdiction is present but more like the broader analysis of how you go about understanding a question a fact pattern figuring out what the issues are and then providing some kind of semi-intelligent discussion on how that works and whether there's jurisdiction or not which is usually the question um, that you're trying to answer and so these sample questions just are everything look at that I have all my scribbles on here um, you know, there's always some kind of like colorful fact pattern, like someone who moves from one um, corner of the country to another and moves states and whether jurisdiction is still present. Usually um, something with airlines is popular as a fact pattern. Um, different people fighting in court, wanting to move around where um, they're actually going to be bringing that case. The facts, I would say the facts are more boring than they were um, for law school essays. For the bar exam generally, they're not as colorful. They're still facts and the way the human brain works is fascinating. We are not good with things that are abstract and the law as it's presented um, in order to take the bar exam and as you know, Barbary kind of digests it for you and gives you these like little things to memorize it's highly abstract and I think many people, certainly myself, like my personality type, really struggles with that abstract level if you don't have the case law behind it. And so this kind of book provides you something that's a little bit more um, explanatory in terms of how all of this analysis works so that you have that kind of structure slowly building up in your brain that it's not just little tidbits of information and then you get to the exam day and you don't know how to put them together like how do you actually analyze for example for a trust fact pattern or a wills fact pattern who actually gets the property when that person has died I mean you can memorize until you're blue in the face if you've never actually read a sample fact pattern and answer and you don't know how to apply all of that it is not going to be good for you. I think usually they like to include at least one wills or trust question that has to do with distribution of property and it's something that people vastly underprepare for because it's not on the multiple choice questions. Use a book like this to help you get to that and get that done. Next up, memorization, because at the end of the day, it still has to happen. Any professional exam you'll be taking, there will be some memorization. You're very lucky if you have an open book exam, but even if you do, you probably will still need to memorize some things. So here we go. 
I have quite a few hacks. I don't think that there's one magic bullet for memorization. If you talk to law students, I'll usually wax lyrical about flashcards. There's nothing wrong with them. I use them myself. Sometimes I use post-its instead um, because I like the sticky aspect, but um, ultimately they're a useful tool, but you'll probably need some other tools as well to survive the bar exam. So here are mine. A trick used by many of the smartest people in humankind and some fictional characters like Hannibal Lecter too, and that weird reference will I think make you remember this, is the memory palace trick. And what that is, is supposed to be this fictional space in your mind. What a memory palace is, is a space you think of in your mind where everything that you need to know for an exam or otherwise is embedded, where you can literally go in your mind, go to that place, go to a chest or a wall and everything is on there. It's very visual. And so if you're not a visual learner, I don't think it's going to really work for you. It's a hack for everyone even if you are not a visual learner, will still help you. Use your actual home as a memory palace. If there's something that you're struggling to learn, sit in a new place. I don't care if it's like the corner near the cat food, go to a new place and sit there and learn it and go back to it to revise it. It sounds so weird, I know, I know it sounds crazy, but it works. If you go to new spaces, alter kind of where you're sitting, I have an egg chair outside on my patio that's actually quite difficult to use for reading because the light filters through the wicker and creates weird spots on your book. But there are specific things that I went to study there about the commerce clause that I can still recall because I didn't sit there that often. I just mostly for whatever reason ended up sitting there for that. Isn't that crazy how your brain works? But it's so important to have hacks like this because guess what? Sitting there passively reading through essays, the large outline, for example, which is a nightmare for Barbary. If you just sit there and just read that, you are at most going to retain 10% of it. Isn't that so upsetting? 10%. You could be the smartest person in the world, unless you're the kind of person who can recall the whole entire page start to finish, like you can just see the page in your mind, you're going to recall at best 10% of it. So you need some tools to hack that, right? To make that work so that you remember more. And when you get to the end, you're able to memorize all of the important key things that you'll need for answering questions, whether those are essay or multiple choice, it doesn't matter. You still need to know those things you need to have it in your head and sometimes that idea of like squeezing this material you know like into your head is just so painful and so there are a lot of little tricks that you can use the memory palace one is an example using your home as a physical sort of memory palace where you go to different spaces to learn different things is going to work even for non-visual learners Auditory learners, I'm one of those. So um, purchasing access to something that has useful videos, not three hour videos, but short videos that are pithy and explain things really well in a short and succinct way, money really well spent. And I'll talk about that in my next video. If you're an auditory learner, please make sure you have something that is either you know podcast based, um, like short audio lectures or videos. You need something like that because it is going to be what works for you. Other senses that you can engage, whether you're auditory or visual, and this one is silly, but it works. Um, these are scented pens, writing out your notes in scented pens, engaging your sense of smell. So these are these fun little pens that I bought from Target. Um, these are two of my favorite scents. Um, they're from Papermate, and I will link them down below. This is Vanilla Blueberry Tart. It smells really good. They are all brunch themed. And this is strawberry scone. I know some of you are just like clicking off because this person has gone crazy now, but it works, right? You're engaging another sense. It's the same thing as, you know, all the girls always using highlighters and having these pretty notes. That engagement with creating something that's visually appealing and you're engaging your brain with that color, you know, bright, beautiful colors. There's a reason that all these animals um, in the jungle and so forth that peacocks have these beautiful tails. I mean, it attracts people, it sticks in your memory. It's very vibrant and something that you remember. So 
bright colors, scented things, paper that's colorful, colorful binders, things like that. These are all ways that you are helping yourself to memorize. Have a ritual. Have favorite foods. Mine are crumpets and bananas. I like fruit and carbs as a kind of brain fuel because you need that glucose in your brain to keep it going. I don't care about like, you know, actual like fuel for athletes as a perspective that might work for you. I need quick fuel and so I had um, you know, little snacks. Some people use candy and energy drinks. That doesn't work for me, um, for my body. But honestly, no judgment. Whatever it is that works for you, develop a routine because you have a couple of days of exams. So you need to have stuff that is prepped so that you are literally like an athlete. You have your routine that's prepped. You have your wake up time. You have your notes that you've predetermined you're going to review on exam day. You have the things that you're going to eat, your toasted crumpet or whatever that you're going to eat. Um, and that is going to get you through and that habit for future exams is going to be a little bit of a comfort blanket for you that's going to be really helpful so I even have my little uniform I like to wear red for exams I have jewelry that I like to wear that are little talismans and yes I'm a little bit superficial that's part of it but it's also building up these habits have these little rituals and again you know you can make fun of it and say that it's a superstition and that's 10% of it for me. But the other 90% is that I'm training my brain to associate those things with success. So if you wear a red t-shirt and you get 90% on your exam for your kind of level one of accounting that you need to do, and then you wear it again for the next more difficult exam, your brain already associates the red that you wore for the first exam with success. Whatever those rituals are, even eating the crumpet, is gonna be built in for you as something that allows you to be successful because our brains are actually pretty basic, right? In terms of how we think and how we associate things. It's not that complex. And so if you do simple things like that, it's like you're literally boosting your confidence without doing very much at all. And those are the kind of little magical fairy dust tricks. You're not gonna make the difference if you haven't studied and if you're not prepared and you haven't done the things that you need to do, but they're the little hairline differences that can carry you over the finish line. Next up is another thing that Barbara tells you not to do, but I think is important for some. Not for everyone, if you've studied that before, you're not gonna need to do this because you've already done it, but if you haven't done it, consider actually looking for some resources and going straight to the root. For me, it was buying a pocket constitution and actually reading it start to finish. Guess what? It's actually not that complicated of a document. It's really beautifully written. It's so inspirational and it's such a bedrock of what it means to be an American citizen. Many still haven't read it despite that. And so if you're actually gonna be sitting constitutional law, let's say you're from the UK or something like that, it's probably not something you've ever read, but actually consider sitting down and reading it because it's not part of your Barbary reading. The fourth amendment won't be included word for word in that chapter about that topic at all but maybe you should read it if you've never read it before and doing that it's not just you know so you can say that you've read it doing that will actually provide you with the bedrock where you're learning what goes on top of that it doesn't need to be much it doesn't need to be reading every supreme court case um, every scotus case that was ever decided on an area it's going to be too much barbary knows that which is why they don't have you do it because you would short circuit i think constitutional law and criminal law are kind of the main areas where i read a few cases a handful of cases and that really made me feel like i was part of something you often don't have to read the whole case and i'm sure this is true for other disciplines as well there there are plenty of people who spend hours who are very smart who've digested it into a summary so you can learn the facts and then you can learn how the law was applied to those particular facts in a couple of pages. How much time is that really going to take you in terms of the grand scheme of how much time you'll be studying 600 hours um, preparing for the exam? Maybe sometimes if an area is either interesting or very confusing to you um, or you're really struggling to memorize something for that area Go to the source, read the case, read the statute, and actually understand where it came from. And then guess what? That you don't need to memorize anything anymore because you get it. I'm gonna leave the more specific bar exam lessons about study prep, 
prep programs, products that I use um, to the last video. Thank you so much for supporting this series. I really appreciate it. I really wanted to get this out. Even if this whole thing helps one person, it will have been worth it to me to be part of your success. So thank you for enabling me to do that. And I will see you in my next installment. Bye.